Well, holy greetings to brothers and sisters. Good morning and God bless you. This is Scott Bradley and this is the Rivers of Life Inspirational Broadcast. We're grateful for you to tune us into this day and put my suit coat on here. This day that the Lord has made and we are rejoicing and glad in it. Thank God for the Lord smiling upon us and bringing us back together one more time. We thank the Lord for smiling upon us. And as Brother Larnell is singing that song, Touch Me, Lord, that is my prayer this morning. Touch me, Lord, with your goodness, with your power, with your grace, and with your mercy. Forgive me for being a little disheveled here. Praise the Lord. We had a few technical difficulties there. That's why we're on just a few minutes a little late. But we are on nonetheless. And the Lord is blessing us and smiling upon us. And has given us a word to share with you today. As Brother Lionel is singing that song, Touch Me. That's what the Lord wants to do. Not only do I want the Lord to touch me, but the Lord wants to touch us. And brothers and sisters, this is the day and time when not only do we need a touch from the Lord, we need the Lord to saturate us in His power. We need the Lord to fill us to overflowing with the power of the Holy Ghost. I want the Lord to fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Let me adjust my camera here a little bit. There we go. Thank the Lord. So again, come on into the room. Come on in. We've got a word for you today. Again, forgive our little... Uh, just shove them in here But we are on course and ready to give you a word from the Lord So please uh, Hit the share button Let other people know that we are on And then of course as we always ask Let us know where you are viewing from So again touch us This is my prayer This is my prayer Touch me Lord Thank you brother Lionel Harris And God bless you Amen We thank the Lord again for being here one more time God bless you All right uh, as we always start off our broadcast, I want to encourage you to get our latest book, The Challenges of the 21st Century Church. This book is relevant even so now. Some of the challenges that are coming against the church today. When I speak of the church, I'm not talking about the religion, the organization, the body, the denomination, or the building, the denomination, the congregation. I'm talking about the body of baptized believers that have accepted Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior and have made Jesus the Lord of their life. If you have oftentimes heard me say, when Jesus becomes the Lord, it means that we take the attitude of servant and the servant follows the leading of his Lord and desires to do and fulfill the will of his Lord. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, brothers and sisters. He's not just, shouldn't be out there just with everything else. He wants priority. He wants first place. That's what the Lord wants out of us. And you know, I'm going to tell you something. I'm looking at the attitude, particularly here in America. Now, you that are viewing us in other parts of the world, I can't necessarily speak for your government or your country, but America is backslidden. America has turned ungodly. And, you know, I, uh, I, I tell you something. I uh, look and see what is happening, uh, and I don't particularly consider myself. In fact, in fact I, I've, I've taken the mindset that I'm just passing through this world, uh, the old uh, Negro spirituals, one of the old Negro spirituals was, this world is not my home. Uh, I'm just passing through. Uh, that pretty much is the attitude that I've taken, particularly in recent years, when I see the direction that this country is headed in. When I see how this country has taken on sin, has ordained sin, has, has welcomed sin, has recognized sin, acknowledged sin, not as sin, but as something good. Uh, I realize that this this country, and it has nothing to do with politics. You know, uh, I, I listen to sometimes uh, people with their political attitudes. You know, some, you know, well, this is the liberals, and, and this is the conservative, and these are Democrats, and these are Republicans. And, and the argument goes back and forth. Both of them are flawed. Believe me when I tell you. I can't, uh, and this is why, and I'm not saying this in any political realm trying to persuade you, but I've come to the conclusion that I'm just an independent voter. I'm, I'm just not... Uh, consider myself loyalty to any party uh, anymore because both of them are, you know, they just ain't together. They're not godly. Let me put it that way. And the nation is, is backslidden. The nation is turning away. And when I see how uh, sin is, 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 you know, people are looking for justifications to sin. The government is backing sin, like homosexuality, like abortion. Uh, people don't even marry anymore. They live together. They shack up and live together. People don't even want to get married anymore, but they want to have children out of wedlock. And, and, and the society has act like this is normal. There's nothing wrong with this. And you got, oh, my God, uh, medical experts and psychological experts and political experts 
that are saying there's nothing wrong with this. Well, basically, the nation has turned its back on God. Listen, I want you to get my book, The Challenges of the 21st Century Church, because if we're going to stand for God, these are challenges that we have to meet. And how shall we effectively deal with them? How shall we effectively stand our ground? Being a Christian in this day and time, brothers and sisters, well, let me, let me go deeper. I, well, let me, for argument's sake, let me let, stay on that term Christian, although I like to consider myself deeper because there's even a lot of flaws in, in that, what people consider Christians. Uh, but being a follower of Christ offends the world. Your testimony offends the world. Your testimony of deliverance offends the world. A few years ago, I haven't probably mentioned this before, but a few years ago, there was a, a Martin Luther King celebration, I believe it was in Washington, D.C. And they invited the gospel singer Donnie McClurkin to be on the program to sing. And the homosexuals became angry and said, we don't want this man to participate because he said God delivered him from homosexuality. Now, here's a man God delivered. They didn't want to accept that. They, 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 didn't, they thought that his testimony would be an offense to them. And so the pressure push came to shell, pressure came to rise, and they would not allow Mr. McClurkin to sing or to glorify God. You know, this is what we're dealing with now. People are offended by your testimony. People are offended by you saying that God brought you out of sin. People are offended by you saying that you follow the Lord and you don't have to take the path of oh, Reverend, everybody does something. Oh, man, what you do? You do something. Everybody doesn't have that. Some people have genuinely given themselves over to the Lord and are following the paths of righteousness. Everybody's not a hypocrite. Uh, Everybody is not uh, one way at home and another way in public. You know, people genuinely are living for the Lord, and the Lord has made the difference in their life. All right, I want to share something with you today. I was thinking about this, and I wonder if I've shared it before. I don't know if I did or not, but I'm going to share it again. <laughs> Amen. Even if I did, I, I kind of looked over the archives there. I didn't see it. If it did, it's been over a year ago. But I'm going to share this again. I want to go to Psalms 51. This is a repentant prayer of David. And today I want to talk on the subject of repentance. What is true repentance? And why do we need to repent? If we're going to follow Jesus, we must repent. If we're going to be saved, we must repent. Don't do like Mr. Trump, former President Trump, who said he never repents. He just tries to do better next time. That is not going to, I'm afraid that attitude is going to cause you to be lost, Mr. Trump, and every one of you that believe that. Repentance is what God is requiring out of us. And even today, God is requiring repentance out of this nation if He wants, if we continue to want the Lord to be with us. Of course, most people don't, not saying they don't believe in God, they get offended by it, don't bring God into it. God ain't got nothing to do with it. That's the attitude of people today. But we need to repent. This was the prayer of David, Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy love and kindness, and according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, look at the prayer of this man. Look at this prayer. He asked God for mercy. Have mercy on me, Lord. And, uh, you know, I looked up mercy. Matter of fact, I got it written down here. I wasn't going to go to my notes yet, but I, since I got it here, uh, the word mercy uh, is compassion for one by one who has the power to punish or do harm. So God has the power to punish us for our sin, to harm us for our sin, to cause us to be eternally lost. We, we, well, we be turn, are eternally lost because of our sin, eternally in hell. For our sin and yet God who has the power to fulfill that has compassion that's mercy that's mercy mercy is not something we deserve and that's something that I think that we need to understand you know I hear things in this day and time now I hear sermons from the pulpit I hear people on Facebook say certain things like you deserve mercy matter of fact I oftentimes tell you all about the service I was in the evangelist told everybody point your finger toward heaven and tell God give me everything I deserve you don't want what you deserve. Mercy is not something we deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve eternal separation. The wages of sin is death. And that's what we deserve. Death. But God is merciful. And because God does not deal with us according to our sin, when we repent, 
he has mercy or compassion. He's the one. You know, it reminds me of when uh, these people brought uh, this woman taken in adultery in the Bible. They brought this woman to Jesus. You know, a lynch mob, basically what it was. A lynch mob that brought this woman to Jesus and said, Now, Master, we caught her in adultery. We caught her in the very act. And Moses said we should stone her. Now, they're going to quote the law to Jesus, who is the giver of the law, not realizing that's what they're doing. You know, uh, Jesus was merciful to her. And, and, and show you what he did. He put the ball, if I can use that term, put the ball back in their own court, all these accusers. First of all, it takes two people to commit adultery. So they were a bunch of hypocrites. They brought this woman along uh, and they didn't bring the man along. Uh, somebody said, and again, I don't, this is simply speculation, but she was caught with one of the priests. Well, of course, they weren't going to bring him along. He, oh, he's one of the religious leaders. No, he, she seduced him. It's her fault. They brought this woman to Jesus and said, now, Lord, Moses said we're supposed to stone her. What do you say? The Bible said that Jesus started writing in the ground, just stooped down and wrote in the ground. Now, we don't know what he wrote, didn't say, but I would not be surprised if he started writing those people's names in the ground because he knew what they were doing. He stood up and these folk got stones ready to go. He that is without sin among you cast the first stone and went back down and started writing in the ground. The Bible said every one of them being convicted by their own conscience left that woman there. Now, notice the mercy of Jesus, because if anybody could have cast the first stone, it could have been Jesus, because he was the only one who had no sin. He was the only one that could judge himself according to himself because he was not had no sin. He that is without sin among you cast the first stone. And when he looked up and saw that everybody left, he said, where are your accusers? I have none, Lord. He said, neither do I. In essence, I'm the one that could cast the first stone. I'm the one that could condemn you because I wrote this law. I am the law. I'm the fulfilling of the law. But he was merciful to Neither do I condemn you. Or his words. Go and sin no more. God is God of another chance. Somebody say God is God of a second chance. Well, you know, most of us blew the second chance a long time ago. God is God of another chance. But let's go a little bit further with David here. I'm going to talk about him. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgression. And my sin is ever before me. Now this is one of the things we have to understand about repentance. David said, I acknowledge my transgression and sin is ever present before me. You know, brothers and sisters, repentance is not, and you've heard me say this on numerous occasions, you that follow me, repentance is not an explanation, which is what we do when we repent, supposedly. We go before God explaining to God why we messed up. That's not repentance. That's not repentance. Because what it boils down to when we give God an explanation, it generally boils down to us shifting the blame, you know. She did it. He did it. If, if he hadn't did this, I wouldn't have did that. No, no, they like that. See, they, they, he, they. That's what we do when we repent, supposedly. We're explaining to God why we messed up. That is not repentance, brothers and sisters. Notice what David said again in verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgression. I'm the one that did it. And my sin is ever before me. Notice what he says in verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Even though there were other people involved. We'll talk about that in a second. But against thee and thee only have I sinned. And then this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. Behold I was shaped in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold thou desirest truth in inward parts. And in the hidden parts. And make me to know wisdom. Verse 7. Purge me. With hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me. Again, he's putting it on himself. And I shall be white in the snow. Hide my face from, hide my face, uh, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy holy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, I would encourage you to read the entire 51st uh, Psalms at your leisure. But again, David is repenting for his failure and for his sin. Now, what was it? Well, most of us uh, think that this had to do with, with his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, which, you know, when you get really get down to it, and I was thinking about this morning, this is really a, a low sin that David committed. It, it was, uh, let me use the term despicable, because he took a man's wife who was a soldier and a faithful soldier in his army. 
He took a man's wife, committed adultery with her, and then had the man murdered in the long run to cover up his sin. The very idea of doing such a thing, you know, uh, again, that would be equivalent uh, to Mr. Trump. And I call him out because he seems like the most likely guy that would do that to uh, take the wife of a private in the army, you know, the ranks private corporal. Of course, my case was private corporal, a PFC, private corporal, lance corporal, taking a PFC. Let's go in that private first class. Uh, well, not private, then private first class. I got to remember my ranks there. You know, the lowest order, a E1, private who's in the military, serving his country, serving his president. And his president, while he is out on the battlefield, putting his life on the line, takes the man's young pretty wife, commits adultery with her, and then sends orders to have him killed to cover up the pregnancy that comes as a result of it. That's low. That's a low individual. And, and, and is. Nathan the prophet made the parable of David and, and, and illustrated it. David became so angry, he said, a man like that is worthy of death. He judged his own self, not realizing that that's what he was doing. Well, my point is this. David does not try to explain his situation. David does not, in, in, in nowhere in 50, Psalms 51, he doesn't blame anybody else. He said, I have sinned against you, Lord, against thee and thee only. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. I've done the wrong thing. And that's where repentance begins. We acknowledge it and then we turn from it. The word repent means to feel or express regret or remote remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. To regret. I wish I hadn't done it. I did it, but I, and this is the thing. Even though you wish you hadn't done it, you did it. So now you have to come clean. Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of things in our lives that we regret. There are a lot of things in our lives we regret. Uh, regret. In fact, I've oftentimes said if we can get in a time machine, most of us wouldn't go forward trying to see the future. We would go back and try to find the younger version of ourselves and try to prevent ourselves from doing something uh, that, that we're still feeling the repercussions of. You know, a lot of time you have to understand something. The Lord will forgive, but the law will not. Many cases, our sins have repercussions that can affect our lives and the lives of others. And some of us years later, sometimes decades later, still feeling the repercussions of something that we did. We were young and foolish. As I said before, repentance is not explaining. Uh, and this is a thing that I think we have to understand. There are some sins that we do that are privately. And there are some sins that are public. Now, I say this to bring out a point. When we sin in private or when we sin behind closed doors, as it were, and, uh, you know, there are no real results of that except that we've sinned, we repent in private. Uh, oftentimes I see people make the mistake of, you know, putting their business out. You know, you, I'm going to make the devil out of a lie. I'm going to shame the devil. Shame the devil. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it what happened. You don't need to tell what you did in private. That's a private repentance. Because what begins to happen is, you know, you start telling all of your business and be very leery, brothers and sisters. And listen to me what I tell you. Be very leery of people that come tell you, come on, you confess to me now. You got to confess to somebody. You come and tell me. Get it? See, because they're just trying to get in your business. It's not necessary for you to have a confidant that you tell everything to. It's not necessary for you to tell, I got to tell somebody what I did. It, what you do in private, you repent for in private. Now. That being said, if you've done something in private and it has public repercussions, you need to repent in public. For example, if you uh, have an affair, and, and, and I want to go deeper in this because I don't want y'all to miss my point. But if you have an affair and it results in a pregnancy, well, obviously you need to repent because now what you've done in private has made a public presentation, a public debut. You know, you, have, you, know, you need to repent to, you know, if you are, if it was adulterous, you need to repent to your wife. You need to repent to the church, especially if you're a high profile person. If you're a preacher that got involved in that, you need to repent to your church. And I'm going to tell you something. You need to take a leave of absence. You know, I heard an interesting uh, situation the other day where someone said that, uh, of course, this was the pastor's daughter, a pastor's daughter, which probably made a big difference. But, uh, he said, well, my daughter, she repented. She got pregnant. Well, she repented, so she can keep singing in the choir because she repented. No, wait, wait, hold it. 
when you do things like that that bring about public uh, humiliation, if I can use that term, uh, or, 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 or reproach uh, on the church, uh, that person needs to take a leave of absence. That person needs to sit down. That person does not need to be ump, uh, up, uh, continue to do, even though they've repented, even though the Lord has forgiven, and you have forgiven, and the people have forgiven, they still need to sit down. They still need to be sat down. You know, interesting thing that happened a couple of decades ago, and I say because it's public. When Jimmy Swaggart had his liaison with this woman, uh, and he got up and he repented and cried and said he was sorry, the Lord forgave him. The people forgave him. Uh, the Assemblies of God, of which he was associated with, said that you need to sit down and take a leave of absence, which was right. He needed to take a leave of absence. What you have done is brought an open shame to the body of Christ. What you've done, you brought a reproach on your ministry, on your church, on your wife, on your family. Your indiscretion has caused a ripple effect. Now, what people do not need, and I want y'all to listen to me because I hope you learned something from this. But what people do not need is for you to continue to stand up there and preach and do this because all it does is remind them of your failure. You need to drop out of sight for a while. You need to sit down. You need to show some repentance. It reminds me of a fella uh, that I knew who had, again, a, a, another adulterous affair that was caught, back, in fact, was caught on one of the TV shows, you know. And instead of him showing remorse and repentance, and he repented, I'm sure, he repented to, to folk. But he got up every time he got up to preach, and he should have been preaching. He should have sat down, took a leave of absence, and sit down. That's the right thing to do. Instead, he would get up and preach and call everybody a hater. All oh, y'all been hating on me. All oh, y'all been hating. That is not showing remorse or repentance. That's trying to justify, well, all oh, y'all, some of y'all doing stuff. That's not what you need to do. That is not showing remorse. That is not showing repentance. That is not showing a contrite heart. That's basically showing a rebellious heart. You did what you did, I repent, and now let me go back to it. No, no. You need to take time, sit down, because every time you are up, sir, ma'am, every time you are up, you're just basically reminding the people of your failure. People need to forget. I know of another situation of a fellow that got caught in indiscretion. He took the advice. Matter of fact, he gave himself a self-imposed uh, leave of absence, a self-imposed silencing. He sat down for a year. Afterwards, he came back, and the people were more loving to him and receptive to him. Some people forgot because he wasn't constantly up showing himself, reminding the people of his, their failure. David, when he sinned, and when he found out, when he was exposed, again, not when he wasn't exposed, he kept on doing what he was doing. But when he was exposed and found out that this girl had gotten pregnant, he isolated himself. Not only did he repent, he went into isolation. And began to fast and began to set, took off his royal clothes, took off the royalty of his, of his, of his kingship, put on sackcloth and ashes as a, and set in ashes as a sign of his repentance. You know, he didn't just, well, okay, y'all got me. All right, I repent. Now let's go back to business as usual. No! The man got in and isolated himself, shut himself away, took off his royalty, took off his crown, took off his title. And went and got among ashes and wore sackcloth, which is basically, uh, sackcloth is like a, when they used to ship potatoes, they, they would ship them in burlap sacks. That's basically what that was. It itched, it was irritable, but he took, put that on himself and clothed himself in that as a sign of repentance. And so brothers and sisters, if we are going to repent, we need to take this attitude. Notice David's sin was public, so he repented publicly and showed public remorse. You know, here's the thing I think that messed a lot of people up. Uh, going back to Jimmy Swaggart's situation, he said the world needed his ministry. So he didn't have time to take off. He wasn't going to take because the world needed his ministry. Well, that's just arrogance. Um, God doesn't need us. Don't ever feel like the Lord needs you. Don't ever feel. I don't let, let nobody tell you that the Lord had need of you. The Lord has need of you as long as you obey. When you decide you're not going to obey and live wrong, God don't need you. God can always raise up somebody else. 
It reminds me when the Pharisees were upset with the disciples at the triumphant ride of Jesus into Jerusalem. And uh, they, they, they laid down palm branches and their garments and said, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the people were getting to rejoice. And the religious leaders got upset. And so they said, Jesus rebuked our disciples. They're making a scene. They're, 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 tell them to shut up. Tell them to be quiet. Jesus said, if these hold their peace. The rocks will cry out. Why? Because God can always raise up somebody to do what you're supposed to do and decide you ain't going to do no more. He can always raise up people. He can always. And, you know, I always look at the significance of that raise up stones. You know, God has done it because in many cases, God has taken the stony heart and the hard hearted. And, uh, you know, people that were in the drugs and, and in all kind of evil stuff. And God raised them up. And they were so glad that God brought them out of that situation until they ran for Jesus. They would preach. They, 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 they weren't seeking fame and fortune. They were just glad that God delivered them from that lifestyle. God raised them up. And they're out there preaching. And some of y'all supposed to be preaching and doing whatever. You got an attitude. God said, don't worry. I got somebody else to take your place. Hallelujah. But again, David uh, uh, showed remorse. Uh, and and uh, again, as I said before, David isolated himself, which was a sign of humility and fasting. Humility and fasting. David isolated himself and gave over to prayer, humility, repentance, and fasting. Again, let me go back to so you know what repentance means. It means to feel or express, not just say it, express regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin an expression of repentance you know america needs to repent i tell you that uh, the hand of the lord is against america i've said that before and i'm not taking that back but more importantly the church needs to repent when i speak of the church i'm not talking about an organization a denomination i'm not talking about one particular group of people or, or this i'm talking about the the body of baptized believers in christ jesus because we've been caught away into prosperity. We've been caught away into looking good. We've stopped preaching the gospel. A lot of these high profile preachers, and I would call you out by name, but I'm not going to, that have, that have become motivational speakers, that have compromised the word. You're afraid to preach against homosexuality. You're afraid to preach against abortion. Some of y'all even talking about it's all right to abort. Abortion is a sin. It's murder. And I'm not siding with any political party when I say that. I'm saying that as a man of God. You know, uh, and, 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 you know, homosexuality, I'm saying it as a man of God. I'm not siding with any political party because I don't belong to none. I'm independent. Thank the Lord. In case you want, I told you at the onset of this. But as a man of God, I cannot side myself with any particular political party because both of them are messed up. Both of them. One of them is support of immorality. The other ones are just as racist as can be. I know what's going on. You know, and I'm not saying I don't vote. I do vote, but I vote my conviction. I vote my conscience, you know, but I'm not committing any one particular because I voted either way down through that. Now, again, I don't mean to jump off on that. That's that, that's really more information that you really didn't know, need to know. But my point is that the church needs to repent. I looked at the way uh, folks supported um, Trump. And I realize why you all supported Trump, because he wasn't Obama. You still filled with racism, even though you're supposed to be uh, uh, standing up in the name of the Lord and this, that, and the other. You're still racist. You're still racist. You're still prejudiced. You, you don't like the idea that a black man sat in the White House. And I'm going to tell you something else. Mr. Obama is to blame for this same-sex marriage. God's going to judge these people. You know, folks say you can get by, but you ain't going to get away. The books are going to be opened, brothers and sisters, when we stand before the Lord. And there's Perry Mason ain't going to be able to help you. Uh, you hire Johnny Cochran, he can't help you. All these hotshot lawyers and fictional and real, real, nobody's going to be able to help you. If you don't repent of your sin, be sorry. Show expressions of repentance. Show remorse, regret. Turn. Don't go do the same thing again. Turn away. That's a sign of repentance. Denounce what you have done. That's repentance. Praise the Lord. Let me get through this because I see my time is about up. 
But as I said before, David did not shift the blame. Understand, he had committed adulterous affair. Now he could have said, well, yeah, but see, Bathsheba, she shouldn't have been out there on the roof naked in the first place bathing. I couldn't help. No, he didn't blame her. He never brought her up. In this entire 51st division of Psalms, Bathsheba is never brought up. Nathan, the prophet, is never brought up. Uriah, her husband, is never brought up. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. I acknowledge my transgression. I ain't bringing them in because they're not the ones that I'm repenting for. I'm repenting for myself. You know, I've seen many cases, brothers and sisters. And I see my time is up here. But I've seen many cases, like the Lord, where people will turn and, and just, you know, find other folk to blame. You know, because basically, self-justification sets us apart from the mercy of God. We need mercy. I need mercy. You need mercy. Every man that is ever born needs mercy. Every woman needs mercy. Self-justification sets us apart from mercy. And I say this in my, in, close, in my closing, that when Saul was confronted by the prophet, he continued to try to justify himself and say that we the people told me to keep this, and we kept this. We got even got deep in religious. We kept these sheep and oxen for sacrifice. Samuel told him to obey is better than the sacrifice. But you know what? What David did was worse than Saul. But the Bible declared that God rejected Saul from being king. But he called David a man after his own heart. After this adulterous affair, after this conspiracy and this, this, this murder and this cover up, God called David a man after his own heart. Why? Because David repented. Brothers and sisters, repent. There's no justification for wrong. This is the title of a message I preach once. There's no justification for wrong. But thank God, there's a way to get right. All right, my time is up. Get my book, The Challenges of the 21st Century Church. We're asking for a donation of $15.50. Simply go to my cash app, dollar sign, Brad2538. Put that up, post that on my cash app. Put your name and address. We'll get the book right out to you. Until next week, this is Scott Bradley saying, God bless you. I love you. And I preach with love to see you repent, to see us all get our lives together and be eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. Until next week, pray for me. We'll talk again real soon. God bless.